plenary talk. It is my great pleasure to uh, greet today Dr. Marsha McNutt, the director of the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, Dr. McNutt, McNutt will be talking about how science made a difference in ending the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, a very timely topic indeed. Uh, Dr. McNutt is responsible for leading the nation's largest water, earth, biological sciences, and civilian mapping agency in its mission to provide the scientific data that enable decision makers to create policies for a changing world. A changing world is our theme, as you may recall. She previously served as president and chief executive officer of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute in Moss Landing, California. Marsha has participated in 15 major oceanographic expeditions and served as chief scientist on more than half of these voyages. She has published 90 peer-reviewed scientific articles. Her research has ranged from studies of ocean island volcanism in French Polynesia, to continental breakup in the western United States, to uplift of the Tibet Plateau. Marsha is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's award, she was awarded the American Geophysical Union's McLuhan Award in 1988 for research and accomplishments by a young scientist and the Maurice, Maurice Ewing Medal in 2007 for her significant contributions to deep sea exploration. Marsha received a bachelor's degree in physics from Colorado College and a doctorate in earth sciences from Scripps Institution of Oceanography. What the official bio does not say is that at the time of her appointment as head of USGS, she was, she was also the chairperson of the Ocean Studies Board of the National Academies where I met her. During this time, I have come to appreciate her many admirable traits, one of her being her generosity in having a, accepted public service. But the traits I would like to remark upon today are her eloquence and her elegance. So, Please join me in welcoming, welcoming that most elegant and eloquent lady, the director of the USGS, Dr. Marsha McNutt. And thank you for joining us, Marcia. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you all for uh, joining me this morning. I understand the salsa dancing went kind of late last night. So in... Um, deference to all of you who um, partook of that, I promise to speak very quietly this morning and um, uh, very gently in um, recognition of uh, the uh, most appropriate, uh, uh, the most uh, uh, appropriate um, uh, celebration of uh, island culture here in uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, so my, my topic today is the, the Deepwater Horizon uh, oil spill. And um, talk about a feel bad story for the ages. Um, for people of my generation who had been through a number of disasters including the Challenger explosion, 9-11. This one just kept coming and coming and coming. You couldn't escape it. You turned on your television and there was that little icon down in the bottom of your screen of that plume of oil coming out of the well, that black death pouring out into the gulf. And you couldn't see a BP spokesperson talking about what they were trying to do to fix the problem, that they weren't juxtaposed next to that plume pouring out into the gulf relentlessly. It didn't just haunt our nightmares it haunted our waking hours as well. We had been through oil spills as well. For example, Exxon Valdez. But in comparison, Exxon Valdez was somehow manageable. We could put our arms around it. We knew to the gallon how much oil had been inside the tanks of Exxon Valdez. 
and yet this oil just kept coming and coming and coming. And that little plume in the corner of our television screen kept reminding us of that. It was in some way the hubris of man that had gotten us into this situation. The thought that drilling in the deep water was safe and that as we had inched our way down the slope of the continent, we could go deeper and deeper and deeper by really doing nothing differently than we had done in the shallow water and everything would be okay because it had been okay. And yet, here it wasn't. Every fail-safe had gone wrong, and we didn't really know what had gone wrong. But here it was, that ever-present reminder that it was going wrong and we couldn't stop it. Science was going to have to get us out of this mess. And so my story today is going to be how science got us out of this mess. And this isn't going to be a comprehensive talk about everything that happened in the Deepwater Horizon response. Uh, I'm going to try to talk mostly about um, the contributions of the USGS with uh, a lot of thanks to our partners from other government agencies and from the academic community. This was an all hands on deck emergency. But because of the unprecedented nature of this emergency and because of its duration, this really was a case where science came to bear on the problem and it made a difference. So first of all, let's look at um, the oil spill by the numbers. Uh, in the final tally, the flow rate of this well was 53,000, um, the, it started out at 62,000 barrels of oil per day. By the time the well was shut in, 53,000 uh, barrels per day, plus minus uh, 10%. That turns out to be about two Exxon Valdez's per week in terms of the amount of oil released, just to sort of gauge it. And that went on for 87 days. Two Exxon Valdez's per week for 87 days of the duration. <clears throat> the total oil that came out was 4.9 million barrels of oil. Um, not including the amount that was contained by BP's efforts to actually directly channel oil from the well up to uh, surface ships. Um, 800,000 barrels of oil. This was absolutely never done before, that oil from a deep water blowout had been directly um, uh, channeled to the surface through risers. So again, a first time ever. Over 1.8 million gallons of dispersants were applied and for the first time deployed in the deep sea with unknown consequences of that. Over 80,000 square miles of the Gulf were closed to fishing um, uh, as of uh, the 10th of, of um, uh, August. And then, of course, uh, most of it has, almost entirely all of it has been uh, reopened now, but uh, with huge impacts to the fishing community in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, um, the USGS did uh, a number of um, of responses uh, to the Gulf uh, oil crisis. One of the first things that we did was um, we mobilized our geographic information teams because we knew that having information on where the oil was and where it was going was going to be critical to the response. And in partnership with the very capable people from NOAA, the oceanographers, and um, the atmospheric sciences scientists, we put together twice daily forecasts uh, in terms of maps of um, where the oil was 
and predictions of where it was going to be in the next 24 hours. And this information was very useful for deploying assets for skimming, uh, shoreline um, response, and um, NOAA developed all sorts of novel uh, methods, uh, three-dimensional uh, oceanographic models to predict where the oil was going. The uh, National Weather Service um, developed uh, novel forecasting methods for uh, what the uh, winds and seas would be doing. Um, and uh, we um, exercised something called the International Charter, which is something that we rarely do, uh, but we did in this case. And when the USGS uh, exercises the International Charter in consultation with other government agencies, what that does is it allows us to declassify, select, um, satellite uh, data, which otherwise would only be um, available to um, under um, classified uh, uh, to uh, the CIA and um, other agencies, but it allows it to be uh, available for uh, response um, in order to um, image uh, from space uh, the oil slick and um, it made a huge difference in this case in terms of being able to image uh, the oil on the water and make uh, better predictions. Now this particular picture of the oil um, was the uh, June 3rd uh, view. And June 3rd, if you remember back, was right when the top kill had failed and right before BP successfully brought on board um, the oil containment through top hat number four, which started siphoning 15,000 barrels a day of oil to a surface ship. So this was, in effect, our lowest low. This was the worst point in the oil spill, when basically none of the oil was being captured, all of the techniques to, con to um, solve the oil spill so far, the coffer dam had failed, the top kill had failed. We were at our, our worst, lowest point. This was the time at which people were concerned about the oil being entrained in the loop current, hitting Florida beaches, perhaps going around Florida, getting entrained in the Gulf, um, uh, in the Gulf Stream and uh, hitting uh, the Atlantic coast, we couldn't have been at a, a worse point at this time. Now looking back on it, we know that some of the uh, worst um, uh, fears uh, fortunately uh, didn't come uh, to pass and we were very fortunate in a number of regards. Um, but this shows just how bad it was at the peak of the oil spill and uh, how important having that bird's eye view provided by NOAA and the USGS uh, was and how important that interagency collaboration was. Another thing we did very early on in the oil spill was the USGS went back and um, we did a lessons learned analysis based on what happened during Exxon Valdez. Even though it was a very different kind of oil spill, we said, what's everything that we learned from Exxon Valdez that's relevant to this oil spill? We even went back to the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill and pulled out of retirement USGS scientists who had been involved in the Santa Barbara oil spill, who were now in their 80s, and said, we need you to remember everything from the Santa Barbara oil spill that we can learn. And we made a list of the important things. For example, we need to think decades in terms of impact and recovery. That it's very common 
for the uh, response community to see the oil go away and think mission accomplished when in fact in terms of the uh, ecosystems and the juveniles and um, all of the cascading impacts on the ecosystems, the problems are just beginning. That we have to consider onshore and offshore and multiple levels of the food chain as a coupled ecosystem. For example, I took one of my colleagues at the Department of Interior to task for um, discussing the um, issue about applying dispersants, um, discussing it in terms of, well, the, dis the dispersant issue depends on whether you're a fish person or a bird person. If you're a fish person, you don't like dispersants. If you're a bird person, you think it's a good idea. And I said, what do you think your birds are eating? Isn't it the fish? You know, you have to consider this all as one coupled ecosystem. Whatever happens to one part of the ecosystem impacts every other part of the ecosystem. We're all in this together. We have to consider the coupled impacts and the cascading impacts throughout the entire ecosystem. They are not independent. That natural variations in marine and coastal ecosystems will confound understanding of recovery. That we know that there are large interannual variations in the state of the ecosystem. That you can have a good year or a bad year in any ecosystem just through natural variation, through things like El Ninos and La Ninas. And that if you aren't careful, you might say, oh, there was a good year for the ecosystem because of natural oceanographic effects. And you might say, oh, the effects of the oil spill are all over. And it was just because of natural variability. And so you have to be careful to tease out the natural effects from what, what might be recovery or oil uh, impacts. That pre spill data is critical for assessing injury to resources and recovery. In other words, marshal your forces, get out there and get as much data as you can before the first drop of oil hits anything, whether it's in the open ocean or on the shoreline, because that you need a good baseline if you want to make a case for what the oil impacts are. And finally, consider how clean is too clean. There was a very famous case from Exxon Valdez of how with very good intentions, uh, response workers went out and steam cleaned beaches in an attempt to get rid of oil residue that was coating the beaches. And in steam cleaning the beaches, they basically sanitized them so much that they killed all of the natural bacteria in the beaches. These were basically uh, bacteria that would naturally have biodegraded a lot of that oil. Those beaches to this day have never recovered. Those beaches are sterile. And um, this is a lesson we have basically taken to heart and in a recent analysis that was done by a number of government agencies, USGS, NOAA, the Coast Guard, they have recommended that we move right now from response to restoration for many of the areas that were hit by the oil spill because they believe we're at the uh, limit of diminishing returns in terms of cleanup and that more people uh, tramping the beaches will actually do more harm than good and we should let nature take its course at this point in terms of additional cleanup and uh, we basically should move to restoration. So in um, keeping with that um, idea that uh, it's very important to get a pre-impact assessment, the USGS immediately uh, launched uh, teams out in the field to get as many samples as possible, biological, uh, soil samples, 
um, every kind of sample we could that would, uh, before the first oil hit the shoreline, that would determine what is the state of the ecosystem so that we would have a good case to make of what did everything look like before anything was impacted so that there would be no question about what was the before and what was the after. Another contribution that the USGS made is, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the story of the Deepwater Horizon, um, there was a, a, a mud boat called the Damon Bankston that was actually tethered to the Deepwater Horizon platform at the time that the well blew out because uh, when the well blew out, they were taking mud out of the well and displacing the, the riser to seawater um, to abandon the well. And um, at the time that the well blew out, um, uh, a rain of mud and other debris came down on the deck of the Damon Bankston. And um, that uh, ship played an important part in um, the rescue uh, effort because as um, the crew of the Deepwater Horizon abandoned ship, the Bankston actually took the survivors and uh, brought them to shore. As that rain of mud came out of the well, there were solid fragments that also came in that rain of mud from the well. And these are examples of some of those fragments. The USGS was given those fragments to do an analysis of what those uh, fragments consist of as part of the um, uh, analysis of what was the cause of the explosion in the well in order to uh, determine uh, forensically what might have led to the explosion. For example, are these fragments pieces of the cement that was supposed to prevent the blowout? Um, are they um, pieces of uh, the rocks from the wall of the um, Macondo well? Are they um, perhaps uh, pieces of uh, the BOP, um, the uh, annulars or um, other uh, pieces that might have failed um, and uh, explain why the BOP didn't work? And so um, the USGS uh, put its best um, petrologists and mineralogists on the job of trying to figure out um, what these um, bits of pieces are and whether they can help explain um, why the blowout occurred. Of course, in doing this, we had to find um, people in the USGS who not only know about the lithologies of the Gulf of Mexico, but had never worked for BP. So that was, of course, a challenge. Um, another contribution that the USGS uh, made was um, who can forget about the sand berm issue? Um, you probably uh, had to um, be in a coma to have missed um, the uh, news coverage from the Louisiana governor and uh, the parish presidents um, who were eager to see as um, a um, response effort uh, the desire to build artificial sand berms as a method to trap oil. Well, it was interesting because if there was one thing that the scientific community was unified in was its um, conclusion that as an oil mitigation effort, the sand berms were a very bad idea. Um, the concern of the scientific community was that the sand berms could never be built fast enough to actually trap the oil and that the sand berms actually might do more harm than good in terms of the fact that they might actually uh, take the sand from the wrong places and lead to erosion of sand and therefore um, be, uh, from an environmental standpoint, uh, very damaging 
to um, the um, natural um, uh, processes uh, in the area. Um, nevertheless, under uh, a lot of political pressure uh, from the state of Louisiana, um, the Army Corps of Engineers uh, did uh, issue the permits for these sand berms um, that at a cost of about, uh, I think it was more than $200 million, um, construction did begin on them. The Presidential Commission, uh, in issuing its report, um, was very critical of these sand berms, um, saying that in the end they trapped 1,000 barrels of oil out of the 4.9 million uh, that were uh, released from the Macondo well. So in a cost-benefit analysis, they uh, were not very useful. The USGS had issued an open file report um, uh, showing the um, scientific uh, issues, but as I say in this case, science did not carry the day. Um, another um, area where the USGS contributed was in the oil fingerprinting. Um, as you know, there are a number of natural seeps of oil in the Gulf of Mexico. And um, in a rather sad um, statement about um, uh, human ethics, uh, it was found that a number of ships used the oil spill as cover to dump oil in the Gulf of Mexico. And so it was helpful to have a fingerprint of the deep water horizon oil and show uh, how it was um, quite unique from other uh, types of oil and could be um, identified um, uniquely so that when oil did hit beaches, for example, uh, Texas or Florida or whatever, it would be possible to go um, genetically identify that oil and determine whether it was Macondo oil or not. Um, because as I say, if it was um, oil from natural seeps, then one could not hold BP accountable for um, that oiling. Or if it was oil that had been purposefully dumped by um, another ship or tanker, then that responsible party should be held accountable for um, that oil release. One thing that I was very involved in was estimating the flow from the Macondo well. As I say, there were no analogs to this event. Um, you know, the um, uh, flow from, uh, or the release from uh, Exxon Valdez was quite different. Um, so um, there had not been an uncontrolled blowout. Even um, the other release in the Gulf of Mexico, the Ixtoc blowout back in the late 1970s was quite different because that was a shallow water blowout. That was only in 50 meters of water, whereas this was a mile deep in the Gulf. So no one really knew how to measure the rate of flow. And yet the rate of flow was so important for so many reasons. For example, BP was, was applying dispersant right at the wellhead. And the ratio of how much dispersant you apply depends on how much oil is coming out. Also, there were a number of uh, interventions that BP was using to try to stop the flow or contain it, uh, such as the coffer dam or top kill. And the success of those depended on the flow rate. In fact, I would argue that um, the coffer dam failed and top kill failed because they had the flow rate wrong by an order of magnitude. Um, uh, the uh, containment capacity that BP was bringing on board at the surface to try to capture all the flow, how do they know how much containment capacity to bring on if they don't know the flow rate? Um, in addition, when we finally did um, shut in the well, the pressure at which it was shut in would depend on how much the well uh, or how much the reservoir was depleted 
and to know how much it was depleted, we had to know the rate at which it was flowing for those 87 days. So there were a number of reasons why we needed to know the flow rate, and yet there were no proven methodologies. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how science was used to get the flow rate. Um, one method we used, um, which uh, in some ways was um, the most novel, and um, was actually very successful in measuring uh, surface oil, um, though the surface oil was only uh, a part of the story because so much of the oil remained subsurface, was the uh, AVERIS instrument, which stands for Airborne Visible Infrared Imaging Spectrometer. This was um, a great um, partnership between NASA, which um, uh, owns the instrument and um, deployed it on um, this uh, aircraft. And this instrument had previously been used to, for example, find water on the moon. And um, it had been used to find um, asbestos in the ruins of the um, World Trade Center bombing. But it had never been used for an oil spill before. And um, the advantage of this was that other techniques that had been used to image the oil spill only came up with the uh, total um, area of the oil spill, whereas Avarice measured not only the area of the oil spill, but also the thickness of the oil, so you could actually get a volume of the oil. As I say, it couldn't measure the oil that remained in the subsurface but it came up with a very good estimate of the oil on the surface and therefore the oil that was going to impact the shoreline. And it also distinguished between the thin oil that was probably not very skimmable versus the thicker oil that was skimmable by the ships. And so it could help target where to send um, the response. Uh, another technique that we used um, was um, the video technique uh, that used particle image velocimetry to measure the flow from the well. Um, this technique had been used, for example, in the black smokers in um, the mid-ocean ridges to measure flux, but this was the first time it had been used uh, to measure uh, a uh, blowout on the, the seafloor and a number of groups were uh, using this technique uh, to uh, measure the flow of the Macondo well. The actual best method we found was the method that the Woods Hole team used, uh, which used acoustic Doppler current profilers to uh, basically uh, get inside this opaque plume and measure 80,000 separate measurements of velocity, which uh, unlike the uh, video group, which could only see the outside of the plume, the acoustic Doppler technique could see inside the plume with the acoustic method and uh, image the velocity profile of the entire um, uh, oil plume. And then they used an imaging sonar to get the um, uh, entire shape of the plume. And these guys just nailed the flow rate, just did a beautiful job of getting the flow rate. Plus, they went down into the uh, ocean with a sampling bottle to get um, a sample of the hydrocarbons to get the oil-gas ratio, which was very critical to determine how much is oil, how much is gas. Um, Another contribution um, from the USGS was from the Well Integrity team. This is Paul Shea, Walter Mooney, me, Steve Hickman, Kathy Enomoto, and Phil Nelson. And this team was charged with determining the integrity of the Macondo well. Um, after the failure of Topkill, the uh, question was, where did all the mud from Topkill go? BP argued that it went out some pressure relief um, discs in the 16-inch casing, and they argued that these uh, pressure relief discs had failed during the initial explosion. Uh, my colleagues at DOE immediately shot down uh, that explanation, saying that the discs were too small to lose all that mud. Um, but uh, that 
obviously um, ruled out that it was the reason for the failure of top kill, but it didn't mean that those discs weren't failed anyway. And that was the reason why it, it seemed dangerous to shut in the well, well from above. Because if those discs were failed, it meant that if you shut in the well from above, hydrocarbons could leak through those discs into the surrounding seafloor and potentially hydrofract up through the mud into the Gulf of Mexico and create any number of blowouts onto the seafloor that would be unconstrained and uncontainable. So on July 15th, when we put a capping stack on the top of the Macondo well to shut it in, the question was, is it safe to remain shut in or is oil escaping through those um, pressure relief discs into the surrounding seafloor and uh, causing a blowout? And how do we distinguish um, a well with integrity from one that is leaking into the surrounding formations and going to cause a blowout uh, or, or uh, hydrofracking to the seafloor? And it was this team that had to determine um, the two. Um, when we shut in the well, uh, we decided that if it shut in at high pressure, then the well probably had integrity. If it shut in at really low pressure, then it probably did not have integrity and we'd open it up right away. If it shut in at medium uh, pressure, then it either meant that the well um, was very depleted um, and had integrity or that the well was slowly leaking. And sure enough, when we shut in the well, it shut in at medium pressure. And so it was in the never, never land. It uh, might have integrity and be depleted, but um, the science advisors to Secretary Chu decided the well should be reopened given the uncertainty. Now, um, the BP um, officials decided they didn't want the results from this well integrity test to go outside of Houston uh, out of fear of insider trading because BP's stock was going to rise or fall on uh, this result. But Steve Hickman took this cell phone picture of the well integrity test shut in. Okay, this cell phone picture that you are looking at right now is worth $3 billion. And the reason it's worth $3 billion is he sent this uh, cell phone picture to Paul Shea at USGS uh, headquarters, or USGS uh, Science Center in Menlo Park. And Paul Shea stayed up all night doing a reservoir model of this shut-in curve. And through Paul Shea's reservoir model, he modeled how fluid flow went through the permeable rock in response to the pressure differential created by the well, particularly as it was shut in, to ask the question, is the depletion scenario credible? Could the well have integrity, and just through depletion, can you match that shut-in? By 8 o'clock the next morning, when um, the government was going to order BP to open up that well again, Paul had his answer. He sent it back to Houston that the depletion scenario was credible, that the well likely had integrity, and that the low shut-in pressure was just from 53,000 barrels of oil a day flowing for 87 days. The Macondo well stayed shut in, and it stayed shut in until it was ultimately killed. So if you take just the Clean Water Act penalties and uh, assuming that uh, best case scenario that um, the relief well would not have uh, killed that well for another month, $3 billion cell phone picture. So um, I know that uh, I'm probably uh, running short of time here, so I'll just quickly go through um, these uh, government flow rate estimates. 
Um, basically, this is the final um, flow rate curve that the government came up with for the Macondo well, and I just want to show you how we came up with it. Um, this goes from day one of the incident to the last day, day 87, and the last day estimate was determined by closing by the pressure readings as the uh, capping stack was closed in and analysis by the engineers from DOE. Um, the day one was determined by Paul Shea's estimate from the depletion rate um, from that reservoir model. And these little jogs in it here are from changes in the resistance from putting on the capping stack, which increased the resistance, and cutting off the riser, which decreased it. And then some of the other estimates we came up with, this was uh, some early estimates with poor data, um, which uh, were not very good video data that we had early on, and the mass balance, which only measured oil at the surface. But then here's that Woods Hole ADCP data. Look at how they nailed the flow rate with that um, acoustic analysis. Beautifully done. And then um, here was uh, uh, a, a summary of final government estimates. Again, uh, pretty good, especially at the upper end. Um, here was uh, an industry estimate. Again, very good. Uh, another industry estimate. Again, pretty good. Uh, this one was a little low. Here was one that came out of Lamont. Again, very good. All of these um, uh, earlier estimates. Another Lamont estimate. Again, pretty good. And here's one uh, based on analysis of the um, gas oil ratio. Again, very good. Uh, I think I'm going to skip these. Uh, here was the final oil budget that came out that shows uh, where all the oil went. Uh, direct recovery from the oil from the wellhead again something never having been done before got 17 percent of the oil released which was very credible um, skimmed despite all of the effort that went into skimming that only got three percent of the oil um, burning uh, got five percent of the oil so that actually um, was uh, an effort that was a little bit more worthwhile um, the amount of oil that was dispersed was about a quarter of the oil. Evaporated was about a quarter of the oil. Um, and uh, so, you know, when you look at this, the way I like to think of it is about a quarter of the oil was in some way um, recovered, either uh, by burning, skimming, or um, directly recovered at the wellhead. About a quarter of it was dispersed in order to um, accelerate microbial um, action. About a quarter of it was evaporated, so uh, sort of went into the atmosphere. And then this quor one quarter of it is the quarter that was sort of the unknown. Where did that go? And this was the quarter that the government put a lot of effort into trying to find. Is it in the sediments? Um, is it um, in uh, the near shore? Uh, is it um, uh, in the food chain? You know, where did, where did this quarter go? Um, some part of this was actually found in the top kill mud, that it was, it's formed a geologic layer by being entrained in uh, the top kill mud. It doesn't explain all of it, but some of it has actually formed this toxic layer um, by having been entrained in all that mud that was pumped for three days uh, in uh, top kill. And uh, it may be very difficult to recover that. So uh, just to end here, uh, did science make a difference? Well, certainly um, new science applications were brought forth to estimate the flow rate. Science was used to make a plausible case for well integrity at a time of conflicting evidence. Science was used to quantify bounds on well integrity as hurricanes and tropical storms bore down on the well site. I didn't get a chance to talk about that topic. And then the scientific method was used to settle all disagreements on the best way forward as well intervention uh, to hasten the end of the Gulf crisis. And this is um, a topic uh, more of social science. Um, I was part of a government team in Houston working with BP. And the
the one thing I will say is that the government team and BP worked very well together. Um, the uh, BP and the government uh, both had a uh, the same goal. We wanted to stop the oil from flowing into the well. Sometimes we disagreed on at any one time on the best way forward. When we did, we sat down and used the time-honored um, methods of science to settle our disputes by saying, okay, what's the evidence? Um, what's the data? What do models say? Um, what um, more data do we need to collect? Um, where, uh, where can we uh, find uh, common ground in terms of the best approach to solve this problem? And at no time did the government have to order BP to do something where BP said, my lawyers are going to have to absolve us of liability. And at no time did um, uh, BP say, uh, you know, if we insist on doing this and uh, the government say, well, if you do that, then, uh, you know, all bets are off and um, we're going to take over from you and uh, you're out of the picture uh, because we don't think you know what you're doing. Because if that had happened, there probably would still be oil flowing into the Gulf because once you get you know, attorneys involved in this um, and it has to go to court, then everything gets tied up. So the fact that the scientists and engineers could resolve their differences using the scientific method was very important to getting this crisis resolved in a timely manner. So thank you all for your attention.